Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Chair DVC Kelly, deans, heads of schools, colleagues, and students. It is my pleasure to be your MC for the celebration of our USP authors. And to begin this session, I invite the university librarian to say a few words about this occasion. Whilst people are speaking, you will see the list, the bibliography of all the publications that have been received by the library from our academics. University Librarian Sinjo Ni. Oops. Thank you, Libby. Um, DVC Kelly, deans, not sure if there's any around. SMT members, heads of sections, and our honored guests, the authors. On behalf of the library, I would like to warmly welcome you to this event and to thank you for accepting our invitation. The Authors' Tea event is the major event in the library's calendar. It is held to honor USP authors and to showcase their work. We are all aware that in the academic world, it is publish or perish. As USP moves from being a good to an excellent university, publications, especially those in highly ranked journals, are essential. Indeed, the number of publications in ranked journals and the number of citations of published research are among the most widely used inputs for ranking universities internationally. Therefore, the pub publications and research that our authors have pu published are important, not only to the authors themselves, but also to the institution. The Authors' Tea event was first held in 2005, and we have followed different formats over the years, including holding it in the evening as an author's cocktail, and some of you have asked me, where's the cocktail? <laughs> uh, but this year, we decided that we would revert to having a day event uh, because we wanted it to be an integral part of the VC's l and forum, which is being held in the, uh, the last few days. Um, too often, there is a divide between publishing and teaching. So we hope that in a small way, having the author's tea in the learning and teaching event at USP will help to bring the two together at USP. We would like to thank the VC and the DVC for giving us their support for this. This year, there are 138 items on display. Fale 34, FBE 30, and FSTE 74. Now I know that, I think that FSTE figures also include the PACE publications. But um, it's interesting that this year we have uh, a few more than last year. So uh, we'd like to um, encourage everyone to keep this up. We apologize if we've missed out on anyone's publications or including anybody in this event. Uh, on my way up, I did meet a USP staff member who said that uh, he was very upset because he was not being included as a USP author. But I think that the problem is that uh, he did not give us his publications. Yes, and that is one of, the, uh, one of the criteria for being included in this event and in our listing. We have to have the publications in the library. And it's not good enough that you have published uh, you have to give them to the library. And that is really important because the library is the place which will keep your publications for posterity and for use by out the outside world. So um, it's really important that publications are given to the library. Um, and uh, I think that he, he said he did give them to the research office. So I will try to uh, talk to the research office after this event to see how we can work with each other, um, that if publications are given to the research office, they should then deposit them in the library. Um, so that's a very important point. Um, 
we've noticed also that there have not been very many works um, by women authors and also by authors from the region outside of Fiji. And this is another area that we would like to, to uh, encourage. I'd therefore like to congratulate all the authors who are here today and um, to thank you all for the good work that you have done and for also depositing your work in the library. The works that you have given us are on display for everyone to see they're behind, oh, there, there they are. And um, we hope that you will browse through them um, before we break for the morning tea. So uh, I would just like to conclude by asking everyone to give, uh, to thank the authors in the usual way. Thank you, Joan. I'd now like to uh, recognize all those authors who are present here, and I would like to ask you to stand up by faculty. Those from the Faculty of Arts, Law, and uh, in Education, please stand up. And we have a round of acknowledgement. Thank you. I'd now like to ask those from the Faculty of Business and Economics to stand up. And finally, those from FSDE, the Faculty of Science, Technology, and the Environment. Thank you. I'd just like at this point to put in a plug for the library and to ask our librarians who are your liaison persons to all stand up, please. Thank you very much. As is a normal part of our presentations, we invite authors to speak on some of the publications that they have had uh, published in recognized journals. And this, today we have four speakers, and the first one is Professor Biman Prasad. He is currently the Professor of Economics at USP, and we know those of us who have been here, he has served as Dean and been as Dean from 2003 to 2011, and Head of Economics. He has published several books and numerous journal articles on trade and development issues in the region. He's provided consultancy services to various international development agencies and governments in the Pacific region. He is an associate editor of the Journal of Fijian Studies and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Pacific Studies. He has been a visiting professor at the Kagoshima University, Otago University, James Cook, and Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is currently a visiting professor at the University of Gujarat and holds two adjunct professorial appointments at Griffith and James Cook University. Welcome, Biman. Thank you, uh, Levy, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor Susan Kelly, Librarian Joan. Uh, colleagues, uh, it's a pleasure to um, speak to you for five minutes. And um, this is um, the book that I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's called Social Policies in Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, uh, together with uh, my research assistant, uh, Paul Kosimai. This research was funded by the Commonwealth Secretariat and the United Nations Research Institute for Development. And in fact, it was published by those two institutions in 2012. Uh, this research, um, or the idea for this research and the idea for this book started with a conference uh, in Geneva where we were trying to look at how small island states around the world were grappling with the issues not only of development generally, but more specifically economic growth and how economic growth was related to social policies and indeed development of appropriate social protection policies for people in these countries. And, and what we did was to not only look at the, the, these two countries, but also look at the Pacific as a whole. But we came up with the idea that we should look at Solomon Islands and Vanuatu because these two countries 
uh, are very special in the sense that since 1975, uh, both of them have doubled their population. Solomon Islands from 190,000 in 1975 to about 490,000 in 2008. Uh, Vanuatu uh, from 100,000 to 220,000 uh, in 2008. So both these uh, countries have had very high population growth of about 2.9 and 2.4 percent respectively. And in the process, uh, the belief was that the traditional systems, the social mechanisms that existed in this country would look after uh, this large number of households, not large number of people who were living below the poverty line. And in our study, we tried to unravel uh, the social political dynamics of what was going on in these countries over the last so many years, and more particularly after independence. And we found that the key issues that were not handled particularly with respect to economic policies was the separation of social policies from the mainstream economic policy agenda. And as a result of that, uh, as a result of the political economy of economic policy making itself in these two countries, many uh, of the appropriate social policies that was supposed to be put in place after independence did not eventuate. And, and as a result, uh, many uh, of the good uh, results that were expected out of a appropriate level of growth after independence did not eventuate. And what we find uh, in the, in the uh, book uh, and what we've sort of come out in the book is the need to not only rely on traditional social policies, but also to look at how governments in these two countries can mainstream social policy agenda in the overall economic development policy agenda. And, and this book is, is timely in the sense that uh, when we are now looking at the performance of Pacific Island countries with respect to the MDG goals, these two countries uh, you know, if you track the progress that they've made and the progress they will make by 2015, in fact, on all the eight uh, MDG goals, they are off track. And the world is now looking at the post-2015 development agenda. Uh, we are talking about inclusive growth. We're talking about, you know, social protection policies. And we feel that some of this... Uh, uh, some of the research results and some of the recommendations that we've made in this book. And I was able to feed uh, some of these in a conference earlier this year in, in Dili in, in uh, Timor-Leste, where the Pacific leaders were meeting to, to come up with a consensus document to feed the high-level panel on the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals that the United Nations is going to adopt in 2014, September 2014, for the world to look at beyond 2015. And, and uh, I think in that sense, the Pacific Island countries have been able to put a, a solid uh, agenda on the table uh, with the high-level UN panel, which is looking at the Sustainable Development Goals post-2015. Uh, so, in, so in that sense, um, we might have uh, contributed a little bit towards uh, that agenda. So once again, uh, I'd like to thank the library for the invitation and for organizing uh, this WATHAS uh, function. I think it is a very important function. You know, it helps build uh, the idea of research. It helps build the idea of, of uh, us all getting together and understanding the, the need for uh, good research not only a good research to publish in A or A star ranked journals, but also research that has significant impact on the quality of lives of our people in the Pacific. And hopefully uh, some of the uh, research that we've done, uh, at least in this area, uh, would contribute towards that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I think listening to what he was talking about, 
conveys to us the importance of what we do here as a regional in institution. If we're not contributing to research and development of our region, what is our purpose? So I think he's given us some very good thoughts on the ways and means in which we can, can address the development issues that um, present us. Our second speaker today is Professor Ansgar Fenker. He received a PhD from Radboud University on verification of real-time and hybrid systems. His research interest is formal verification, in particular model checking and static analysis, and the application of formal methods in design and the development of systems. His work currently focuses on static analysis for C, C++, and on analysis of wireless network protocols. Professor Fenker was until 2011 senior researcher at Australia's ICT Research Centre, NICTA, and prior to that he was a postdoc fellow in the model checking teams at Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome, Ansgar. Um, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, for those who don't know what formal methods is, and uh, maybe if you, you might know me and you think, oh, this guy is actually not that formal, uh, usually, but I'm actually in formal methods. So formal methods is kind of uh, uh, the mathematics of computer science. So we put everything in formulas, everything has to be according to a certain uh, format to prove that things actually work as they should work. Okay? Um, there is a bit of habit, and quite often it actually works. I mean, most things we have work. Uh, usually uh, by good engineering practice, but uh, in software quite often people just develop things and hope it works, and they run it a few times, and it kind of works, and then they get it out in the world. And then later you get all these uh, weekly updates for fixes, because it apparently didn't quite work as well as it should have worked. Okay? So if you every Thursday you get your Windows update, uh, that's because uh, they found another mistake that had to be fixed this week. Um, the paper that I wanted to present today is on uh, modeling and verification of a, a micropayment protocol. Um, this is joint work with uh, Kailash Chaudhry. You might know Kailash from, as the person who does the timetabling at USP. So whenever you've got a class and you're not happy, that's because Kailash uh, put you on a Monday morning at 8 or a Friday evening at 5. Um, he's one of the PhD students here. And uh, he used to work at this micropayment protocol before. And uh, so when, uh, as soon as we uh, worked together, we started looking whether it's actually correct, whether it's actually working. Uh, micropayment is uh, uh, systems for payments online uh, that don't involve credit cards. For some of these payments, credit cards are just way too expensive in handling and doing things. And uh, for this region, for example, credit cards is also a problem because lots of people don't have a bank account. Uh, so these micropayment systems don't assume that you've got a, a bank account. Uh, they just assume that you get something like electronic cash. Uh, what you want this cash to do is to work similar to normal cash. Okay? So normal cash, if I get a coin, I don't know who owned it, where it came from. I just trust that it's a coin. Okay. With a credit card, they always check your bank account, or at least your validity. So, so it's not anonymous. Cash is quite anonymous. You can just pass it around. Um, as soon as you go online, you've got a few problems. So one is uh, um, confidentiality, uh, that everything is encrypted and can't be hacked. Uh, for our work, we assume that that actually works. So there are uh, secure protocols to communicate with each other. The question still remains, does it actually work, even though the communication is uh, secure? So what does it mean? So one thing is, if you handle cash, you don't want that just by normal use of cash, suddenly your cash does become invalid. For normal cash, we say that's of course. I mean, just passing around a few dollar bills uh, or coins doesn't make it invalid. Uh, and in an online system, you have to show this, that whatever you do to the thing, it doesn't become invalid. Another thing you want to show is um, that there's a chain of trust. So currently when I go shopping, I trust MHCC that whatever money they give me is valid, and they trust whatever they get. And you want to show for e-coins the same, that from the customer they, they trust the vendor, the vendor trusts another vendor, and at the end they trust the bank, without actually knowing exactly how the money went around. 
so that there's a chain of trust even though you don't know everything. With credit cards, you keep a track of every transaction. With e-cash or e-coins, you don't want to do this. Uh, then um, there was another thing that we uh, uh, proved for this one, uh, is that you don't get stuck. You don't want that uh, in your protocol it doesn't return at some point and just goes away with your money and you don't get any reply. Uh, that's, uh, if you go to a bank, uh, I had this at ANZ, if they don't know how, what to do with your check, they just have a little chat and they're kind of figuring out ad hoc what to do. Uh, an online system can't do this. If you do something that's not quite what they anticipated, they can't go around and figure out what to do. You have to anticipate everything. Um, for this paper, actually, there's one thing we didn't prove and, uh, for the system, and that was we, we didn't prove that you can't spend the same money twice. There's normal coins, we know this is, you can't spend your same money twice, but of course, electronically, you can make as many copies of your cash as you want. Um, and there was one good reason for that we can't prove it, uh, because uh, the system that we looked at, it's not our system, uh, we have a good reason to believe that it actually doesn't ensure that you can't spend money twice. I mean, usually you can't, but sometimes you can, if you're lucky. Um, and that's something that's not quite what you want. But as I said, people just implement things. It most works most of the time. But if you don't prove the correctness, you can have these glitches. I mean, uh, we, we know how to fix it. Uh, but the, the system that we looked at didn't have this. I mean, most of the time it works, but if you were unlucky or lucky, you could maybe spend your same money twice. Uh, currently, we're looking at a different version of this protocol that doesn't have this problem. So there we were able to prove uh, that you can't spend your money twice, uh, that uh, the money remains valid, um, that you don't get stuck, and that you can trust what you get. Um, uh, these proofs are still by, made by hand. Kailash uh, just started last year with his PhD, and uh, usually we start having people doing everything by hand. But nowadays, um, people trust more and more only computer-generated proofs. So uh, whatever you, uh, by now, computers can actually do the proving or ma much of it for you, because proving things is quite difficult. And having a computer doing it for you makes your life easier. Just, and uh, there is a growing consensus that if you are able to ex uh, convince a computer that something is correct, it's more likely correct than if you comp uh, explain it to a human and they are convinced. Because humans are often a little bit hand wavy and saying, oh yeah, yeah, I, I can see this. Uh, a computer, you have to be really precise and explain it. And that's the next thing that we do uh, using uh, automated techniques to prove the correctness of these type of protocols. As I said, for our region, uh, uh, the relevance is a bit that uh, these are, these type of protocols are, are upcoming. I mean, we've got M-Pesa, we've got SMS banking, we've got all kinds of bankless things here. Uh, and uh, we hope that we can contribute to developing secure systems. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Ansgar, for that. I think when I was reading out what his interests are and backgrounds are, the non-scientists must have been thinking, what is this? What is he going to present to us today? But I know as soon as he mentioned cash and money, everybody woke up and thought, mm, yeah, that's something I'm interested in. So thank you very much for that contribution. And I'll now like to ask Vina Rambidesi to come and present. Vina is a senior lecturer in the School of Marine Studies, Faculty of Science, Technology and the Environment. She has a PhD from the University of Wollongong in Australia and an MSc degree in Fisheries Economics from Ka Kagoshima University in Japan. Her research interests are in fisheries management, natural resource policy analysis, gender issues in the marine sector and integrated coastal and ocean management. Her current research is on the valuation of mangroves in Samoa and an economic assessment of destructive fishing practices in Kiribati. Welcome, Vina. Thank you, Libby, uh, DVC Kelly, and deans, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the librarian, and, and members of the senior management committee. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my paper. Uh, in fact, it is a conference uh, paper which I was uh, asked to write something about uh, gender, gender issues uh, in uh, an international symposium in, 
uh, in Ryukyu's University in Japan. So I thought hard about uh, what new I'm going to talk about gender issues. So really, uh, in fact, my article, uh, Improving Fisheries Management Through Empowering Women in Small Island uh, Communities. So how, in fact, we can empower women to, to uh, help in uh, fisheries management. So uh, I'll just uh, briefly talk about uh, what uh, is in the paper and also, in fact, uh, what uh, sort of uh, transpired me to, to look at this integrated approach. So my paper really touches on fisheries management looks at marine education, uh, and also it has a cultural and uh, ethical perspective, uh, as well as uh, look, uh, it looks at gender issues. So I try to bring all the elements together to look at uh, fisheries management, because uh, basically when we look at the region now, fisheries is uh, such an important resource both uh, for economic uh, development as well as uh, for sustenance, for livelihoods of coastal communities. Uh, and when we look at the status of the resources, it is uh, uh, almost overexploited in the coastal areas. There are so many issues uh, with regards to uh, important species declining, as well as in the industrial sector, in the tuna sector. Uh, we see that uh, there are management measures in place, but uh, in fact the, uh, the industries are not following, uh, and we still hear uh, that there is corruption uh, uh, going on and even the leaders are not following. Uh, and when we look at, uh, in fact, our surroundings, uh, we are uh, a maritime region uh, and we don't know enough about uh, the ocean environment or the marine environment. Uh, education in the marine, in, uh, mar uh, on marine education, sorry, starts uh, very late, even in high schools, uh, uh, in primary schools, there is nothing that really focuses on, on marine studies as such, but it is integrated in geography, in social science, uh, and until students come to USP, to School of Marine Studies. Uh, and also when we look at the, the nature of fisheries, in fact, women are involved in the fisheries sector. Almost 80% of the catch from coastal areas uh, is, uh, in fact, carried out by women. Uh, so, uh, f firstly, when we look at, in fact, the discussion or the policy direction in fisheries management, more and more there is a realization that uh, fisheries management is not about managing the stock, but in fact managing the people's uh, activities. So it really sort of looks at people's attitude and behavior, how we can, in fact, uh, uh, change the incentives of fishers. Uh, so more and more there is a realization that uh, we should be really looking at improving marine stewardship and marine citizenship. Uh, and so when we look at this gap in the region that uh, in fact our children do not uh, get uh, um, exposed to the marine environment, awareness about the marine environment uh, very early, uh, then many, uh, many times uh, in fact um, uh, they are already conditioned. So uh, basically if we start marine education, whether formal or informal, at a very early age, uh, then they become aware, in fact, uh, their, their ethical and, and cultural values uh, develop uh, as they grow up. Uh, and so I, I did the study in three villages. I looked at how, in fact, the children spend their time. Uh, and so uh, I found that um, many... Uh, Many times it's the women or the female members of the family who are looking after the children. So really the children's learning environment uh, is very much conditioned by the time they spend with women. Uh, and so uh, even women take the children out fishing. So really they are learning how to catch fishing skills and so on. Uh, while they are with their mothers and grandmothers and so on. And even those women who don't go fishing with the toddlers, they are still leaving uh, them with their um, grandmothers uh, and uh, female members. So, so I bring that together to, to look at how, in fact, uh, uh, we can improve mar uh, awareness about uh, marine education is really trying to look at addressing the issue of gender within the fisheries sector. 
that if these women have access to resources, training, uh, they are also included in decision making uh, and they are uh, made aware ab uh, about the code of conduct for responsible fisheries, which really looks at uh, uh, sort of a, a general guideline on how fisheries should be carried out. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, uh, so that is why my title is Empowering Women in Fishing Community so that they, in fact, can instill these values about marine stewardship, about use of the environment, about sustainable development to the children so that as they grow up, then, uh, in fact, it comes naturally rather than when they are grown up and they are already conditioned. Uh, in, in so many ways uh, that it is really hard for them to change their attitude and behavior. So two ways. One is really to look at, to look at improvement of marine stewardship, which is really individual's uh, attitude towards the environment. And the other is looking at policy makers and, and decision makers uh, in their individual capacity. We most often focus uh, on um, institutions and organizations when we're looking at policy, but we, we do not really reflect on individual decision making as part of the unit or organization and how individual uh, is affected by their own values uh, uh, and ethics uh, to make such decisions. So, uh, in fact, I have been asked to to write an expanded version of this uh, symposium paper as a chapter in a book that will be also translated in Japanese. So I've already submitted the expanded chapter. So that is, uh, in fact, uh, uh, an outline of my, my presentation. Uh, that I'm trying to combine the different elements, so it's really looking at an integrated sort of approach to address the issue of fisheries management. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vina. I think many of us get involved in big national issues and national pictures and how we can change the nation, but Vina is working with the women on the ground and seeing 80% of them are the ones undertaking coastal fisheries. They will impact on the attitudes of the young children who are our, our youth leading forward. So thank you very much. Very important uh, for us to hear about that. Our fourth and final speaker is Govinda Lingam. He's an associate professor in the School of Education in Fale. His work experience includes secondary teaching in Fiji, rising to the position of head of department for mathematics before serving at the then Latoka Teachers College, which is now part of the Fiji National University. For 10 years, he was senior lecturer in education and head of school of education. He obtained a bachelor's and master's degree from USP and his doctoral degree from Griffith University in Brisbane. He teaches both undergraduate and postgraduate courses, and his research interests include relating to social justice in education, professional development of teachers, educational leadership, values education, and teacher education. He is currently the OSPS president and staff representative to the USB Council. Welcome, Governor. Uh, good morning to you all, and uh, once again, congratulations to all the authors. And I know this occasion will also motivate many others to contribute, and you will be celebrating that next year. Uh, this opportunity is a grand opportunity for me to briefly say something about the two publications which I made last year. One is on educational leadership, and the other one on teacher workforce planning. Let me briefly touch on the leadership one. Leadership, as you all know, is very critical in all organizations and very, very important in educational organizations, whether it be a preschool, primary school, or secondary, or even a tertiary institution. And what is lacking in most of the schools or educational organizations is that people are not well led. There is a lot of administration but leading for positive changes or development or improvement in the organizations is lacking in most of the uh, settings. So what is needed is more professional development opportunities for educational leaders at all levels. 
and not only for people out there in the school system, but also in tertiary institutions. And it's uh, nice to see that the university has also taken some positive steps to try and prepare leaders at all levels so that they are able to carry out their roles and responsibilities effectively and efficiently. So the book on leadership uh, basically imparts that message that no one is born a leader. We have to prepare leaders because of the manifold changes which are taking place in education at all levels. We need to see that we upskill them at all times so that they are able to better respond to the changing demands aspirations, interests, and expectations of the stakeholders. The other book which was published last year is to do with teacher workforce planning. What uh, I found out that uh, most of the education ministries in the Pacific want to improve the quality of education, but the planning approach which they are using to supply teachers to schools is an outdated one. If they want to improve education at the basic level, whether it be primary, ECE, secondary, then not only teacher-people ratio is to be considered, but many other important variables are to be taken into account. Teacher-people ratio is just one aspect, but over the years, you all may know very well that the work of teachers have intensified and using that simple criteria to supply teachers to schools will not in any way help improve the quality of education, especially in the small island developing states. In the case of Fiji, for example, over the years, a lot of reforms have been introduced. And recently, classroom-based assessment, and that requires a lot of work on the part of the teachers. And if teachers are overloaded, then definitely they will not be able to produce quality work. And the children are the ones who are going to be ultimately affected. So what uh, message is delivered in that book is that the education ministries or the stakeholders need to see that we have adequate supply of teachers in both terms, qualitatively as well as quantitatively. If quality teachers are not available, then we will not be able to maximize children's learning outcomes. In one of the small island states, for example, Solomon Islands, we have almost one third of primary teachers who are untrained and are in the system. And I know not as to how long the Solomon Islands government will take to train them. So if they remain in the system as untrained teachers, then we all know as to how adversely they are going to affect children's education. So quality teachers, not only at the primary school level or EC level or secondary school level, but we need quality people at all levels of education. Even in the tertiary institutions, the workload and all that is increasing, and therefore we need to use some other better approach to determine as to how many teachers or staff we need in our organization. So that's in brief about the two books, one on educational leadership and the other one on teacher workforce planning. With those words, once again, thank you, the library staff for organizing this occasion, and also to all the others, congratulations once again from the OSP president. Thank you. Thank you very much, Govinda. Leadership and planning are intrinsically linked. Oftentimes, the leaders are also the planners. So if the leaders aren't trained, the planning is likely to go askew. So thank you for that presentation. We've come to the end of this, but I did notice that some of our honored guests came in a little while after we had um, acknowledged those present. So could I just ask all our honored guests to stand up for one more round of recognition? FSTE. FALE and FBE, please all stand so that we can see you once more. Okay. On behalf of the university librarian, I 
Thank you all very much for gracing this occasion and being a part of it. We acknowledge your contributions to research and uh, research within the university and to teaching as well. With that, I would like to invite you all to come and view the publications for 10 minutes, following which we'll ask you to go to tea, enjoy a cup of tea, and then be back here for 11.15 resumption of presentations. DVC Kelly, thank you very much. Well, thank you, and I'm, I think it was uh, well worth people uh, coming out to hear from these four authors and to know that there are so many more in our midst. I, I do urge you, I think it's wonderful that so many of you did come out to hear your fellow uh, scholars. I, I urge you to uh, not just have the tea, but to come back for the last three presentations. I have to say, it's wonderful that you came, but I, it's really a bit disappointing that many of you didn't come to hear that your colleagues present their papers. So with that sting in the tail, just uh, enjoy the work here, but the part of this community is being a part of all of it. If, we, if there are anybody who works here who doesn't need to know anything about learning and teaching, I'm not sure why they're here. Thank you.